the double egg loop. Yeah. Now, what do you use that for? Um, I tie I, I tie almost all of my leaders that way. So almost everything I tie is that same double egg loop. And so if you wanted to, you could slide it back and you, put a yarn or yep, something in there. Yep, that, that was, the I think, the original intent behind it. I just like the way it behaves. It seems like a strong knot. A strong knot, yeah. And so I just tie everything like that. So when I'm sitting around, I tie leaders, like and I said. And how long the leaders do you generally tie? I don't know. A couple feet. It depends. Um, I mean, what you buy in the store is, what, 10 inches, maybe? Six yeah. inches? Yeah, so let's just see what one of these is. I mean, I kind of just do a arm's length. I mean, that, so I'm not going to fish anything over I a two-foot leader. Yeah, measuring. you're good. Uh, so that's 28. Yeah, that's so two-foot. I would never fish that whole leader. Okay. It's it's made to have extra, so i got room to work with, with whatever I want to do. And then typically I cut it down to something like that probably, okay. 12, 16 inches. Um, it, but it depends, okay, and I wish I had a one-size-fits-all for you. Well, no, I'm just I'll give you the best, the best rule of thumb I can give. Hey, guys. Hey, if we need more chairs, they didn't set anything up, they're right in here. So if we need some more chairs, go ahead and jump in there. Um, Dodgers. So, the general rule of thumb is one and a half times your dodger. So okay. if this is a six inch dodger, you'd be a nine inch leader. Okay, and what do you call this? This is a dodger. Oh, a dodger, okay. Yep. So, and this will just sit here and swing back and forth. Right. Ultraviolet really useful? I think the fish see ultraviolet. Mm -hmm. So, between glow in the dark and ultraviolet worth it to me. Okay. Yeah. Let's leave those here. There's more fish if you guys want some more smoked fish over here. Okay. Well, we'll wait just a couple more minutes in case we're going to be straggling in before we get going. So, how are you guys? Good. Back for more? Good. Good. I don't need this up. I was showing him something, wasn't I? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you say three times the dodger? One and a half. Mm -hmm. Is a general rule of thumb. Now it depends on your lures too. I mean, if they if they have their own action, which some of them do, if they have um, like a bill or a little disc, you can run those a little further back. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think there's some rule of thumbs like earlier in the year, further back, and then in the summer when they're real aggressive, shorten it back up and then back out in the fall. That's just like trout kokanee. You yeah. talk, start talking salmon, we're running a little different gear. So, okay, let me just do one more check here, see if there's anybody I know out here. No, all right, we'll get started. So, last week we kind of talked about some basics and uh, we got into some shore fishing tactics and stuff like that. So this week we're going to do a little bit more boat tactics. So, um, more trolling, stuff like that. But feel free to jump in. Um, I'm going to go through some stuff about colors and, and a lot of that applies to the shore side as well. So, um, but we're going to focus on the shore. Okay, so I'll just show you some of my standard um, poles and stuff here. Uh, we're talking um, Spokane County, right? So you got to get a little ways out of town to get into some salmon, and um, those are a little heavier rods. So I'll, I won't go into too much of that this week. So for me, what I've been fishing here, this is an eight-foot ultralight. 
So it's a real super light rod, pretty good flex on it. This is not an expensive rod, it's a $40 rod. So you don't have to go spend a gazillion dollars if you don't want to. Um, one of the big things I will tell you is that I think more important is a line counter. When you're setting your stuff out, you want to know how far out you are because that's going to almost determine your depth depending on weights and things like that. And so it's really important to have a line counter so you can set that consistent length out every time because the fish are going to be in, say, 15 feet of water. You want to be about 15 feet out. So if you go out 100 feet and you're not getting bit and you come in to, say, 80, maybe you're too deep and you come in to 80, you start getting bit, you want to go to 80 every time. So it just helps you with that consistency to have a line counter. Now, there's alternatives to that. So I'll show you like this rod here real quick. This is um, what's called lead core line, and it's got, a, it's got about 50 feet of mono at the end of it. So let me try to pull some out here to show you. What it, what it does, uh, it's just going to make a mess. Um, the line itself is like a braided line. Um, it's called Dacron. But inside there is lead, a lead core. So the line is weighted. So for every 30 feet, 10 yards, that you let out, that's called a color. So typically, most of these are manufactured such that they change color every 30 feet. Okay? So what you'll be told is let out three colors. So you're letting out 90 feet of braid plus your 50 feet of mono or how much of a liter you have on there. And so that's that would be 90 and 50 is 140 feet out. But that, that lead core is going to get you about five feet down per color, five to seven feet, depending on your speed. So just by running lead core, you're getting your baits down deeper. So how many different colors are on that? This particular one's pretty full. It's a pretty open reel. I think I've got seven or eight, but I'm typically running two to four. Okay. But you do need a bigger reel for this lead core because it is pretty thick line. Okay. There's several different sizes um, as far as pounds of test. So it goes from, I think, like about 12 to 30, roughly. And the, obviously the thicker, thicker the line, the heavier the stuff. So you just want to make sure you have a good reel. Um, this one I got uh, uh, from the garage. I mean, it was sitting in my dad's garage bin, just sitting there unused. You can find them on um, like Craigslist or Facebook or yard sales, or you can go to the store and buy a brand new one. They're probably $65 in the store for a new one. But this is a pen, and it's what I call an open face reel. And so you want something a little bit bigger. These ones would hold it, but not, not near as well. So you want quite a bit of line capacity on it. Um, and when I'm talking line capacity, if you read the reels, there will be a, I can show you guys real quick. Down here on the bottom, it'll tell you some numbers. So it'll say like 14 oh. slash 240. Yep. So that's the size of line. That's the size of line and how many yards. You guys have seen that, yeah. So right down there, it tells you. So you can see that on the box or on the reels itself if you got an old reel and you don't know. And then you can go online and find a calculator for converting lead core to this and how much on and on and on. But YouTube will help you if you want to say just set up lead core. It'll tell you how to do it. But lead core is a big thing. I, I really hadn't fished it much. I started fishing it this year and it made a pretty decent difference. There's a lot of times we're catching fish on lead core and nothing else. It also affects the action of that lure. Being that lead core, it's kind of like a big chain sitting there. So it's kind of got its own unique action on it versus your other lines. Okay. So that's two of the two of the setups I'm running. Now this one's kind of a um, unique deal here. Has anybody seen one of these before? Nobody knows what this is. Okay. This is what we call a side pointer. Okay. And the whole goal here is when we're fishing winter or early spring, those fish are up high. And when your boat goes through the fish, it spooks them off to the sides of the boat. So what we're going to do with this thing is you're going to hold this in your hand. You're going to let out your 100 feet or however far you get your bait where you want it depth-wise, uh, 50 to 100 feet, somewhere in there. i got a chart I'll show you here in a little bit. So once you get that set out, then you're going to clip in your line right here like this. And these um, from the store have a little rubber band deal. You clip them in. Um, but I've modified it with this, this clip here. And then what this does is this is going to run out here away from the boat, okay? And then so you just continue letting line out. And if that's sitting in your boat like so, 
This is going to fish out here off the side of the boat now. And then your bait's going to go straight back. So as your boat goes through the water over there, it spooks the fish right over into your bait. Okay? And when a fish bites, you'll just see your pole shake. This will pull free and slide all the way back to the whatever weight, and you just reel this in with the fish. Okay? This is called an inline side pointer because it's on the line. Okay, there's a couple different manufacturers. Um, Offshore Tackle is another one. There's even 10 or 15 more. So these are inline. This one is called a Sidewinder. You could get these at North 40. Um, Sportsman's has them. Uh, Lure Jensen makes one that's a little bit different design. That same idea, it pulls away. Um, these are nice. They're quick and easy to deploy. But one thing I don't like is now you have all this weight when you're fighting that fish. So. Um, I have a video on this on my YouTube. I won't go into it too much here, but they make these where you can mount a pole mast to your boat, and then you run like a, almost like a rope out to a side planer, and then you'll attach your line to that, and then when it comes off of there, you're fishing the fish one-on-one -on -one without all that extra stuff. So a little bit, a little bit more advanced stuff there, but I thought I'd cover it real quick. Just so if you hear me talk about side planers, that's what we're talking about. This is really the way to get started if you want to just figure out what you're doing with side planers. These are 15 to 20 bucks. That other set I'm talking about is probably a, at least a couple hundred to get into. So, Not necessary, but it, it did add fish to the boat. A lot of times our stuff on the outsides are getting bit and the stuff behind us is not. So sometimes those fish spook to the sides, especially when they're fishing um, Lake Roosevelt Kokanee. So those kokanee are real um, sensitive to the boat noise and they spook to the sides. Okay, so let me just break down this line a little bit more now that I've kind of talked about the three different ways I set that up. I'm typically running 10 to 20 pound mainline braid for my baseline. Um, this one here I use for salmon sometimes as well. And so I've got like 30 pound on it. Okay, and then this is kind of my standard go-to here. So I've got what's called a weed guard. And it, if you're fishing anywhere where there's weeds, your weeds will hit your line and they'll slide down and hopefully slide off of this and not get tangled up on your line. It's kind of the idea. Might save you a little bit. And then I run a, there's a bead in, that's stuck inside there. So I run a bead and then this is called a uh, sliding, I call them a slider, sliding swivel. So it just slides on your line and you can hook weight on there. And I'll walk through a, a bottom walker in just a second to show you how that works there. So what happens is as a fish hits, it doesn't necessarily feel that weight so much because that slides. It feels more of the pull. So if we want to get a little bit deeper, and again, there's a depth chart I'll show you, we can hook weight on here, and that'll help pull your gear down as you're trolling. Now, with that big weight right there, I like to run a leader back to my presentation because that weight will dampen the action. So two, three feet here gives me plenty of free line past that weight to not affect the action. Okay. Um, they make another style of these for salmon fishing that I use. It's called the line lock. With a salmon setup, we're running the spinner that's spinning the whole time. And if you get any kind of weed or something, your main line will start twisting. And so what they make here is it's called a line lock and it comes down and it grabs that first eye and it keeps your main line from twisting. So um, it's a company that makes it, it's called VIP, very important person VIP. And uh, they, uh, it's called a line lock. And I would suggest if you're going to do any big salmon fishing to get some of those. This piece here, this leader is also called a bumper. So we're just bumping the line away from that weight. And then this particular setup with that weight on there is what we call a dropper. So we're using a weight to drop it down. So that's called a dropper. Okay, and I already talked about lead core. So that's kind of my basic setup. Um, have I always fished that that way? No. Um, but that's what I go to now. On your lead core, you don't need any of that because you've already got that lead core doing all that. So I'm just going straight to like a swivel there. Okay. And just knock all that over. You guys hear the bell ringing? That's my 
audio indicator of a fish bite. So I just have that zip tied on there. So when it starts shaking, I know a fish is biting. Okay, one thing I want to show you real quick. I haven't talked about it too much, but walleye fishing. When we're walleye fishing, we're down on the bottom. And so what we're trying to do is we're trolling and we're dragging the bottom with this thing. But you, when you're on the bottom, you got rocks and stuff, especially if you're trolling. So you don't want to snag up. And so that's what this does. It kind of helps you get up off the rocks and walk along that bottom a little bit more. So how that'll work is right where I had that weight. You just clip this guy in there. And of course, this will run back to whatever you're pulling, worms, or we'll, we'll get into some of that walleye tactics here in a minute. So what I'm doing here is if I'm on the boat, I'm, I just, I lower, I don't feel the bottom, I let out some line. And then I feel the bottom. Then my pole bounces a little bit like that. Okay, and then I kind of want to just keep in touch with the bottom as we're drifting along. And that's what that bottom walker is. Okay. So that's how you walleye fish. And then what you'll feel is it almost feels like a snag, and then you'll feel the fish, set the hook, reel it in. So are you, um, is that trolling or is that just... That's trolling, yep. Um, if you're not trolling for walleye, you're typically running some sort of um, a jig. They make like a blade bait or a jerk bait, and you're just every so often just kind of letting it come up and settle down and come up, and it's, it's mimicking a wounded fish. But I troll these, um, this, call them warm harnesses, um, slow death hooks is what they're, what I call them. But they're just like a smile blade and it's got this kind of quirky hook on it. And that causes, you just hook a worm on there and that causes that worm to spin as you're trolling. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go too. But that's, that's, that's my basic walleye setup. If I don't know what I'm doing, I start there. And I just troll walleye about, one mile an hour, real slow. Yep, just enough so that I'm warm spinning. Um, I do have some of these that have like a spinner blade on them. Those you have to run just a little bit faster because they're a little heavier. You run those with the drop weight? Yep, all this stuff, yep, all that would just go right here, right back off of there. And I'm typically just using a worm for that stuff. I had all that in there, but we'll just leave it for now. So questions on that pole setup at all? I know I kind of ran through a lot there, but um, it, it's only if you want to fish deep. Uh, you can get away in the early part of the year up top with just your lures and like a, like a diving Rapala or something. We'll get down five feet and you can find fish there. But I tend to fish all year round and stuff gets deeper and deeper. Badger Lake in July, I'm running like three, four ounces, 50, 50 60 feet down. In, not down, but out to get it down to like 30 feet. So, okay. So some of the tactics we touched on a little bit. Um, so speed, speed's a variable depending on what fish you're fishing, what gear you're pulling. For me, it's more important that my gear is behaving correctly. If, if I'm going so fast that the gear's funky, it's not gonna catch fish anyway. It's not working the way it's designed to work. Um, so like a dodger, you want a nice slow back and forth. If it's spinning, you're probably going too fast. Um, so, so you gotta kinda watch what you're fishing. You don't wanna fish something on this pole that you wanna run at say two miles an hour and something over here that's designed to run at a half mile an hour, you'll never get both of them happy. And so if you're going out with somebody, you wanna just make sure you try to match gear a little bit, right? And your buddy's not putting on this and you're putting on that, that's not gonna work. Depth is another important part. If you, if you guys have fish finders, you can look at that. One of the big starting points is the thermal cline. If you can find that on your screen, it's usually where there's like kind of a strip of fuzzy stuff. And that's where the water is changing from like warm to cold and that tends to be where the food sits in the water column. So if we've got a lake that's 50 feet deep, I would say generally you're talking 20 to 25 feet is where that's gonna be. And that varies, like right now it's probably at 10 feet. Um, as the year goes down, it'll sink down as it gets hotter. Uh, we'll get into some of the different lures. We talked a little bit about the planer boards. Um, 
and then this is a downrigger here, okay? So what a downrigger does is it really lets you control your depth, depth right? Very precision. Now these can be, be a little bit more expensive, and that's why I, I showed you this kind of dropper thing. That's very inexpensive to get into. The downriggers, you're probably at 100 bucks a downrigger just for an entry level one. Um, but they make really fancy ones that track the bottom with sonar. Now, are you steering the fish away with the boat if they're really deep? No. Yep, you're right. So as we're talking about downriggers here, I'll give you a rule of thumb. You want, it, you, you want your line out plus your depth down to be about 100. So if I'm fishing 20 feet down, I want 80 feet of line out to get away from the boat at 20 feet down. If I'm 100 feet down, I don't have to be very far off my balls, off the down under here. So, you don't have to have a down under control, right? nope, nope. This just really locks in that depth, and I'll explain how this works here real quick. So you set your line out based on that formula I just gave you, and then you clip it right here, and you send this ball down however deep you want to fish. So if you set it at 15, your lure is at 15. And so it's really easy to target the fish right where you want it. I've got a, one of the videos I have, Dad's watching the fish finder, says go to 45. And before I can get it to 45 and reel up the slack, the fish is hitting it. So it's almost like calling your shots at some points. Um, you can mathematically figure it out with the dropper, but this you, you're pretty sure where you're at. Um, and then the nice thing about this too is then when the fish hits it, it pulls out of this clip and you're not worried about this big, heavy eight, eight pound ball anymore. You're fishing the fish one on one. So with these, sometimes on the smaller fish, that weight, you don't feel as much of the fish because you got that weight on there too. Um, so you can kind of see, yeah, see here's your lure, fish hits it, pulls out of the clip. Okay. On a down there, the one thing that's different is your pull is bent way over because you've got to pull up the slack in that line. And when the fish hits it, if there's a bunch of slack, you just give all that fish that slack, you can wiggle the hooks out. So you have your pole bent way over, and what you see is your pole shakes just like this a little bit. Okay? So sometimes that's tricky for people to see that for the first time, is what a downer looks like. Again, it's kind of some advanced stuff there, but I'm covering it all. Up here you can see those inline side planers. It's kind of hard to see, but that's a side planer, that's a side planer. And then up here, okay? So those two guys are fishing four poles, and they're probably fishing a 100-foot swath. Okay, so as their boat makes noise here, they're fishing out here. All right, so the depth chart that I was talking about. So if you've got a fish finder, most people do they have boats, but if you don't, if you're just going out in like a, just a barge or aluminum barge or something, it's okay. Cold water, you're probably in the top 20 feet until I'd say maybe first week of June, depending on, depending on the year. Some years it's warmer or colder. So I'd say after about 65 degrees, they're, they're starting to go down. Maybe 60, so. So start high, and then if you're not getting bit, just keep letting more line out, more line out, more line out to get deeper until you find the fish. And that's why that line counter is important. So you can run your stuff out at say 80 feet, no bites, Go to 90, go to 100, 110, and just keep working it down until you start getting bit. Or if you're fishing a couple buddies and you have like the two pool endorsements, so maybe two of you are fishing four lines, maybe go 70, 80, 90, 100 and see which one gets bit. And then kind of mimic that rod that got bit. Um, and then like I talked about with the lead core, I usually start with three colors. That's quite a bit of line out, but that gets me about 15 feet down. I feel like that's a good starting point, and then I can go higher or lower depending on what the fish are doing that time of year. It's more of a, it's more of a cold water earlier, earlier in the year, later in the year. It's not the best tool for summertime, like July, August, because they're usually pretty deep by then. Okay, so this trolley thing, does this kind of make some sense? So this is what weight you have on your line. So you can run like a little one ounce weight on that little clip up to six ounces. Sometimes for salmon, we're running 12, 16, two pounds of lead on there. But let's just say you've got a one ounce weight and you let out 70 feet of line, you're at 15 feet down. And you can just Google trolling depth chart and, and these will come up. There's four or five different ones floating around out there. 
I'd print one off and have it in your boat if you have a boat or just have a picture of it on your phone. I reference this all the time. I don't try to memorize any of it. I just go, okay. But again, start at something. And if you're getting bit, great. If you're not, adjust. I kind of think, uh, I don't know if anybody's NASCAR fans, but they bring a race car to the track and it's a little fast or a little slow and they keep adjusting to get it right. That's how fishing is to me. You're always adjusting to try to get it better. Okay, so let's talk colors for just a minute. So in this chart, what we're showing is the color spectrum. Okay, so this is the best conditions of water, like super clear water, Lake Chelan, Roosevelt at times. And then this is like regular conditions, like Clear Lake, for example, or Badger Lake. It's pretty clear, but there's some milkiness to it, right? So what we're saying here is the color red can only be seen at 40 feet and 25 feet in murky water. After that, it just looks like white. Okay, so if you got really dark water, you want to go darker colors, and the sunlight affects that. So the more sun, the more brighter colors you can use because it's going to pen that light's going to penetrate that water deeper. Okay, so if we're fishing at 25 feet, let's say the fish are at 30 feet. Okay. And it's a it's kind of a cloudy overcast day. They're not going to see red and orange as well as they'll see greens and blues and purples. Okay, and so that goes to this chart here, which is cloudy day, dark colors; sunny day, light colors. Seems seems weird, but that's the way it is. Questions on that? Kind of some basics to go off of. Of course, there's, does that mean that a red bait won't get bit? Not necessarily. It could mimic whatever food source they're after and that's what they want to see. But that's a good starting point. All right, let's talk about some of the different lures. And I got a bunch, but we'll go through some. So, spinners. Don't poke yourself, but here I'll just let you look at one. You guys can look at those. So some of these are store bought, a lot of them are ones I just tied up. So we can make some of those tonight. Along with spinners, I call these lake trolls. So I just kind of run these ahead of there usually. And what we're trying to do here is mimic like a school of fish. Okay. So you run your main line to this, and then you add your spinner after that, and it just kind of looks like several fish swimming by. And I've got a bunch of these different ones made up, different colors and whatnot. So you can buy these in the store, probably like 10 bucks, and I, I make them for quite a bit less. Lots of different kinds of spinners out there. Um, different manufacturers, different brands. So that's what we're talking about when we see spinners. What happens is this, this blade on there is going to be spinning round and round as you're trolling. Okay? And so feel free to do color combinations or whatever you want there. And so those are the spinners. Um, there's different sh types of blades too. Uh, what you were looking at there are mainly willow leaf. And then there's also uh, Colorado is another one I use. It's more of a deep cup. So, you were asking me about UV earlier. A lot of these beads will glow under a black light, and some of them will just glow in the dark. And so, so especially like early in the morning, you put some uh, flashlight on these, and they glow. Send that down real quick; they'll get bit just from glowing. So those are spinners. Um, another type of spinner. or in the spinner category are these guys. And instead of having a blade, they've got what it's called a smile. It's a steel blade, but it's made out of like a foil. It's a smile blade. And um, these are also labeled wedding rings. So you can shoot, see the sh shiny ring in there. So you hear wedding rings a lot. Yeah. That's what we're talking about there, that diamond thing in there that just acts as an attractor is a wedding ring. So you can buy these uh, blades and stuff at the store and kind of amass your components here to where you're just making them on the fly if you want. 
North 40 has a blades and stuff like that? Um, yeah, North 40, Sportsman's Warehouse, online. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Yep, and over time, just get a little bit here and there or whatever. You can definitely go overboard. I know I do. Okay. Plugs. We're talking about plugs. This is what we're talking about. Um, something like this. Okay. And so what those do is they'll dive down. Um, and you can run this just as is. It mimics a fish. Sometimes I put a little worm there just to give it a little scent on that front hook or shrimp, either one. So different colors, different sizes. Um, another type of spinner that we didn't really go over is something like this. It's on a metal. Let me set this down somewhere. They'll be on a metal wire. And they're going to have like a rooster tail. But the whole idea is that that blade is still going to spin as you're trolling. And just add some attraction to it. So those are plugs. You know, they just look like little fish. That's all they are. If you happen to find the one that is mimicking whatever bait fish is in the water, those work really well. Uh, Brad super baits. These are kind of a unique thing. So these guys here. I got one that's not rigged up. So what these do is you, you can you get them rigged up, and there's a couple different ways on the package. It'll show all that, but um, they, they, they ultimately slide on your line, generally. But the really unique thing is there's a split cavity that opens up like a clamshell here, and you've got two options. They, they come with this little foam pad that you can put scent on. Or a lot uh, for salmon fishing and even for trout, I've been using them. I just put tuna fish in here, like tuna fish out of the can. It goes right here. Okay, and then that just closes up and you got this little little band that goes on there. And then as that spins around, it's broadcasting that tuna scent. This little right here is called um, a Lincoln, it's copper. I probably put 60 trout in a boat at a clear lake with just this one lure. This year, this year. So since about June. Uh, and they come in all kinds of sh colors and stuff. I've got some on rods at home and stuff like that. But uh, this other one here is called a, it's a style, it's called a Mexican hat. And it's kind of got that almost perch mimicky color. And it's been a really good one too. So. If I go out to Clear Lake, I just run three or four of these. That's all I fish, and they were nailing them in June last year. We'd go out um, three o'clock or so and be done by five or six in the, in the evenings, you know, in the heat of the day even. So those are Brad's super baits. They, that's the size called kokanee cut plug. When we start talking about bigger salmon and stuff, they make two more sizes of that style and one that's a long skinny one for salmon. Same idea. They open up, you put tuna in them. Hey, Go ahead. Water, patch, or oil? I prefer oil. Okay. Tuna and oil. Um, there's a lot of guys that will take half and half and mix it. Everybody's got their own secret tuna recipe. I'll share mine with you, but uh, I got a slide. I'll show you it in a minute. Just remember to ask me again. So. Uh, uh, hoochies. So these are kind of mimicking like a octopus or shrimp or something. So these are called hoochies or squitters. And again, there's a thousand different ways to tie these up. But that whole thing is there's those little hairs are going to pulsate as it's bouncing along behind your dodger. So then you can just put like a little piece of corn or some worm on there. And this is a good all-around lure for trout kokanee. Um, you can add spinners to them. This one has a, a bill that makes it kind of wiggle, like those plugs. Um, there's another style here. This is called a wiggle action disc. And it looks like a satellite dish. It's upside down. And that's it kind of pumps as it goes along the water and darts. So as we were talking about later length, these ones that have their own action, you can run a little bit further back because they're gonna, they don't need to dodger so much to create the action. 
something like this, you can see the leader's fairly short. That dodger's got to pull this back and forth like this and cause it to surge in the water. Um, and yeah, so just lots of different colors. This is, uh, I don't think I have this up there. This is called an Apex. They make those in a store. That's, just, that's a pretty good one. Um, they have their own kind of wiggle action. So those are some pretty effective lures there. Do you use two hooks on most of this one? Yeah, almost, almost always. Um, general rule of thumb is three, up to three trebles. Yep. So it's in that it's in the pamphlet and and I, now you go to some like special rules, but in general, up to three hooks, up to three treble point hooks. I read it as just three hooks, so a treble. A treble is still a hook. So uh, we talked a little bit about the slow death, that's the walleye setup. Um, I have fished these for trout. I have been fishing for walleye and caught trout. I have just put these on and run these out there just spinning around with a worm and they do well for trout once in a while too. So the slow death is that kind of crooked hook there. Okay. And then you put whatever you want in here, a bead with a smile blade, um, spinner, whatever you want in front of it. But as you're trolling, that's going to cause that worm just to roll. And so they call it a slow death spiral. That's the brand name and it's the type of hook. Slow death. I would pick up a package of those. They work wonderful for trout and walleye. Okay, so you guys, if you weren't here right at the beginning, I did talk a little bit about a dodger, but let me just pull one of these out real quick. So these are dodgers. And what a, the whole point behind a dodger, three different kinds here. It doesn't matter too much here, but color. So the whole point of this dodger is as it's here, it's going to swing back and forth and cause your lure to move. And so it looks more lifelike and the fish chase after it aggressively. Okay. This one here is uh, made by a company called Kokobo. Uh, it's kind of a unique shape here. It's called, um, the actual style is called Catchmore. So Catchmore, sometimes these are called spoons too. If you're looking around at um, different things, you guys can pass that around. This, see that way? If their intent is for motion, why are they because they do look like fish in the water too. So as this is moving around, it looks like, oh, what's, what's that over there? What's that shiny thing? I want to go look at that shiny thing, right? This is called a skateboard um, type dodger. It's just, it's bevel on both ends. Um, this one's a little cousin of the one I use for sockeye salmon a lot. I don't have any of those with me right now, but um, again, this is just the same kind of action. Just kind of sways back and forth. And that's, uh, you can see the paint job there. This is a, uh, what we would call like a swing blade type dodger. Um, and this one's pretty pliable, so you can bend it to change that action. So the more bend you put in it, the more sh sh or that. And so if you're going faster, you can actually take a lot of the bend out and it'll still work at say two miles an hour. But if you're going real slow, you put a big bend in there and it'll sh 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 So that's kind of the unique thing with those. This one, I just started fishing this year and have been just killing it. These are called old goats, old goat lures. Um, guy used to work at Microsoft, I think, 3D princes. And so, um, so these just kind of work um, as they're pulling along, they just, they shake quite a bit. And so you just see I'll pass this one around. You just rig them up with some hooks behind it and some beads, different colors there. I get crafty and paint them whatever color I want. But that's kind of the, that's the rundown. That's all the stuff you can go spend your whole paycheck on. <laughs> and then some. So, yeah. I don't think I got anything else exciting in there. Now, I, like I told you guys 
at the last class, I'm the cheapest guy you know. So a lot of this stuff I'm actually making myself. I can go, um, some of the websites I showed you before, one of them, Hagen's Fish, they will sell you a blank piece of metal that you paint. And that blank piece of metal is a dollar instead of ten dollars come all put together. So that's kind of, I'll buy 20 of those and then paint them and put, my wife has a cricket so I can cut the foil out and get pretty, uh, pretty interesting with that kind of stuff. Okay, so trackers. I've been talking about these as we go, but we'll just retouch on them, make sure I hit them all. Um, that's like your Dodger. That's your inline trolls. These little guys. Just stuff we're trying to get the fish's attention with, right? So this is just spinning around. It looks like a school of bait fish, maybe. And so it comes up and goes, oh, what are those bait fish doing in my territory? And then it sees your bait and grabs it. Um, I don't have any with me right now, but I, for salmon we use a, a big flasher. And, and the big di difference between a dodger and a flasher is flashers rotate and dodgers dodge. Okay. Um, the salmon ones that we have have a little fin on them, and that causes them to, to, to roll over. They make small ones for trout and stuff, but that's generally something I'm fishing salmon with. Yeah, no worries. Um, so the other few things we can use to attract the fish, bait and scent. And sometimes that's a combination of the two. I always forget there's a weight room right above us. Um, so I'll talk about some of the baits and scents I'm using. Okay. Um, I would say most of the time I'm running corn, tuna, or just a nightcrawler worm. If I'm shore fishing, I'll throw power bait marshmallows in there. Um, but for the boat, all these things that you have, those two hooks, I put a piece of corn on each hook just to give it some smelly stuff. Okay? Smell and color. The fish sees that thing out there and they go, what's that corn? They're more interested about what that corn is. And so they come over and bite at it just because it's corn and it's not supposed to be there. So how I make this corn, is a, there's a guide called Slammin' Salmon, and he's, if you Google Slammin' Salmon's corn recipe, that's my base corn recipe. He's got a jar of stuff now, um, it's like eight bucks for eight ounces, I think, or something. And you could just mix a can of corn and half of that bottle, and you're done. So that's one way to do it. Um, but his recipe was this, this pro cure and dye. And so you're, this starts as just white shoe paid corn. You can get it at Walmart, Yolks, any grocery store, Amazon. It's a dollar and a half a can, give or take. Not not very expensive. White, white, corn, you said? white shoe peg, shoe peg corn. Um, a lot a lot of the fishing stores will have it on the shelf too because it's used a lot for bait. I don't know if anybody actually eats this stuff, but it's used for bait all the time. Um, but it's usually on the shelf at Walmart or and or Yolks here in town. Um, and so then I color it uh, pink, orange, green. Those are kind of the main three colors I use. You can leave it natural. Get creative, right? This is kind of our fun, creative time where we can do whatever we think we feel like we want. We want it to be pink and orange and purple. We can do that. Um, so you can see I've got a, these little cups I got at the dollar store. And so I start with just an orange dye and a pink dye, and then I separate those. And so I have plain. And then I have garlic tuna. So I take some of the, the oil from the tuna and oil, and I put it in there to give it a tuna smell. And you can buy scents, every scent imaginable in a bait shop. Um, anise krill is another one I like. Um, it's kind of fishy, shrimpy smell. Um, the anise is like licorice, so it's a sweeter smell. Sometimes vanilla is good. Um, but you can see this is kind of a main thing, garlic salt. And then this is just orange fire cure and dye here. And then the chicken of the sea is my favorite. Some guys will swear by bumblebee or in oil, in water. So if you just Google tuna recipe, you'll see a whole bunch of different stuff and you can take your pick. But I like, I've been just taking the fire cure and all I'm doing that for is because I don't get the fish every day, so I'm not going to use this up before it goes bad, typically. So if I cure it a little bit, I get a little bit more 
longevity at it. I fish this stuff a couple months though, basically until it molds or it smells sour, one of the two. Um, but that just that just stiffens up that tuna. And what am I doing with that tuna? It's going in those little scent, those little uh, brads. Okay. And so that's really what I run the tuna in, and it just adds a little tuna smell to them. Um, and like I said, the corn, we're just putting a little piece of that on there. So sometimes I'll run corn, tuna, worm, and see which one's getting hit that day. If I'm fishing trout, all three of those will work. If I'm fishing kokanee, it's tuna or corn. And kokanee, for me, don't tend to hit the worm. So if, I, if I've caught my limit of kokanee and I want to target trout, I put a worm on there. Questions on that stuff? I know I kind of breezed through quite a bit here, but I, I, gave, I threw the whole gamut. Uh, one thing I did not talk about. I'm not a fly fisherman, but I fish flies. Okay, so we troll these trolling flies quite a bit. Um, I buy two different kinds. There's a brand name called the, I don't, I'm probably going to say it wrong, Kakita. You get those on Etsy. And then there's another one called Frisky Jenny. North 40 had those last time I was in there. Um, Sportsman usually has them, or you can go on their website. They're out of Coeur um, They have they have a, May, a bigger one that they run up in Pond Array for what they call the Gerard's big old trout, like 30 pound trout. Um, these are the Roosevelt specials, so they're just a little smaller for Roosevelt. Um, I tend to like them with the treble hook trailer, so they're tied on a single with a trailer. Um, but you can see the colors. I like orange and black. I like this perch pattern. And then I think I just got one of every color. So you can see there. I, I clip this right at the end of my lead core. I run them behind a dodger. I'll put worm on them. I'll put corn on them. I try not to. I not, try not to put any scent on this this stuff because then they get kind of gummed up and you can't change the scent once you scent these things, you know. So I usually try to do the scent with the bait. I'll add a spinner to them. I'll add one of those little uh, wiggle discs. So you can get creative and, and just all kinds of different things. Um, another one I use is called an Arctic Fox. Um, the general store actually on Division is another good place for tackle, come to think of it. And there's a place on Argonne at the, it's a hardware store. Ace Hardware has a fishing hole section. So a couple other places, if you can't find something, sometimes swing in there, they might have it. Fishing gear's been tough to come by lately, but these Arctic foxes, anyway, they're tied on a tube, so it's kind of hard to see there, but there's a little tube in there it's tied on. Oh, yeah. And so you just slide that tube right on your line. And then uh, those are actually a pretty economical way. They come with one hook, that tube, and this action disc. Um, I think it was a couple bucks, so really not bad. These other ones are like six, seven bucks. So they can get kind of spent. That's this is the one thing I spend money on because I can't tie flies yet. A uh, whole other box of other kind of flies. Yep, yep. I, I'll run those at the same speed right behind the Dodgers I would a hoochie or uh, any of that other stuff. The spinners. I'll run that fly back there too, and it's just gonna kind of pulse it. So you can see, you know, boxes of components here. Um, Bymart and Cheney or Deer Park's another good place. Um, I'm seeing stuff and won't remember where I bought it. Um, but the smile blades, the wiggle discs, you know, and then, then I just grab stuff and I have those leaders I tied up and put it all together and make whatever you want. Okay, um, the one thing I did not touch on last week that I want to back up to, preparing your fish. So, um, we want to typically try to knock that fish out or slice a gill right away to put it kind of put it to rest. Um, I bleed my fish, so either in my cooler, what, I, what I've done now is I've gone away from ice so much as I have like frozen jugs, so I've been fishing off, so I just freeze the jug, throw it in the cooler, and when I catch my first fish, I take like three scoops of water and put it in the cooler to have a kind of an ice bath. Throw the fish in, cut its gills, let it bleed into the cooler. And then that way you get all that blood out and um, the meat will be a lot better and more firm when you get home. If you're on the shore, you could use a bucket. So um, so then just some other things. That, that's how you want to take care of it in the field. When you get home, a couple different ways to fillet. 
Um, I, I'm not going to get too much into that. There's videos that will do a much better job than me trying to explain it, but I'll give you the two basic ways. One is you come up the anus right to the throat and rip all the guts out. Okay, that's a good field dressing. Then you've got a fish that has all those guts out that's going to create the acid and stuff that the fish starts going through when it dies. You get all that out. And then you can go home later and slice that off. You can cook it whole. A lot of different ways to do that. The other way that I tend to do now is just leave all that intact and I kind of go back at the head and then along the side and just pull that whole fillet right off. So is it appropriate after you bleed it to throw that back in the water you just came out of? Or what's the actual... There's a lot of debate and I don't want to really get into that too much, but I think, I think a lot of people tend to do that. What you don't want to do is do it in a place where people are going to be swimming. If you have the beans to go out a little deeper and dump it in there, I'm I'm a proponent of putting that back, those nutrients from that fish back into that food source because other fish will eat that. And so if you keep that in there, that's food source for that lake. Um, where you get into some trouble there is if, if we're talking about a regulated species where you have to tell what kind of fish it was and if it had a fin or not, and now all you have is two fillets, that's where fish and games will be like, was this a hatchery fish or was this a wild fish? And if you can't prove that, they're going to write you a ticket. So that's where you get a little gray with some of that. Yeah, yep. But for the most, anytime I go, like when I go up to Brewster and there's 300 guys fishing, there's carcasses everywhere. So everybody's doing it. Yeah, yeah. I, it, some people will have a heart, real heartburn about it. Um, as long as you get it away from where everybody's going in and out of the water, I think it's okay. okay. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll just go back out and dump them over the deep water. It's mentioned in the, the fishing pamphlet too. Okay. It says not to do it. Fish where you swim. Yeah. And then it's like bite boat launching. It's basically don't eat the fish. Yeah. Right. Well, that's what I was like. What's. Yeah. But if you're just bleeding it, you're not. Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm Guts. Yeah. You know, I mean. Right. Guts, I think it says they can't be seen. Otherwise, deep enough. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. So. Yeah. And, and it, uh, some of the forums I'm on, people go right. all over the spectrum with it. So I just. I mean, they I, mad, oh, they do. They do. So. I think as long as you're courteous to others and, and you can identify your catch, those are the two big things and that'll be my, I'll take that one to the grave. Okay, so um, I'm not going to get too much into cooking, but I, if you guys are interested, you know, there's all kinds of stuff out there. Basically, you can pan fry, bake, barbecue, smoke. Those kind of the general ways. Breading is pretty good too. Questions? I know we kind of hit a lot. Um, tonight as far as boat stuff, anything you want to look at more, or um, I kind of figured we'd spend the rest of the night, um, if you guys want to build some lures or something, we could just take a few parts and make up some lures, or... I gotta go with your kid. You gotta go with your kid, okay. Well, we'll be here next week with stuff, too. Yeah. So...